So uh, this is a Beyond Campus event. We do these uh, in both St. Louis and Kansas City, uh, somewhere between about uh, four to six times per year. We're still working on uh, exactly how many we want to do. We've, uh, they've become really successful. This is our third year of having a regular calendar of them. Uh, and right now we're putting together the calendar for next year, and it's going to be really good. Um, did you know that IKEA and Vikings are connected? How many people knew that? I didn't. All right, they are. And we'll tell you how uh, next year. Um, but <laughs> we're only able to do these things through partnerships. Uh, we could come here, and if nobody showed up, uh, there'd be no value. And so it's really important that all of you are here, and we really appreciate that. Uh, so thank you all for coming out and spending Tuesday evening with us. Uh, but it's other partnerships as well, uh, through the college, the university, and so on. And one of our sponsors who's helping us uh, fund the lovely beer tonight, uh, which is produced by an alum of Mizzou. All right, MIT. Uh, 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 the Legacy Society, and I'm going to have Andy Quaddy talk about that. Thank you, Super. Um, I'm going to keep this short and sweet because I don't want to keep you all from the program, but like he said, my name is Andy Quaddy. I'm with the Legacy Society, which is our planned giving society. Uh, for the majority of folks, that means that they can't get through their will or trust. And so we are just here to kind of let you all know that if you have any questions or want to discuss any of that stuff, um, I'm happy to answer those questions. We've got some brochures at the uh, head table. But otherwise, let's get to the program. All right, and I will be very, very brief now. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce two of my colleagues uh, in the Department of Statistics. Uh, Chris Wickle, who is the department chair and curator's distinguished professor. Uh, that's an honor uh, bestowed only to our best faculty, and Chris is certainly one of them. Uh, and uh, his colleague, Aaron Fleet. Okay, I did. Uh, they're going to be talking today about sports analytics, and I can start to tell you what that is and everything like that, um, but they know it better than I do, so with that, I'm just going to turn it over to uh, Chris and Aaron. Thank you all. All right, thank you. Thanks, Cooper. Um, thanks for coming out. Uh, this is like the best two nights of the year. We did one of these in Kansas City about a month ago, and the awesome thing for me is I love sports, I love beer, and I love statistics. And I'm sure you all do. Well, maybe not the stat part, right? But the other two. Um, so Aaron and I are going to give you um, an overview of some of the stuff that we've been doing at Mizzou in the College of Arts and Science uh, related to sports analytics. And uh, we'll give you a little bit about the history of it, a little bit about um, kind of where it's going, and then some of the cool stuff that's happening because of the data revolution that's going on right now. So we'll tag team this. I'll start it out, and then the boring stuff, Aaron will come in, and, and we'll make it as exciting as we can. Now, I know that the, the screen size is a little bit smaller than what we're used to. Don't worry about that. We'll try to tell you what's on it if you can't see it. And if anybody is interested, we can make the talk available to you, and we'll, we'll tell you how we can do that later on. Okay. So um, one of the things uh, that, that is happening now is the data revolution that we're facing all across um, all aspects of society. You know, your phone generates more data now than the computers did 30 years ago. Well, this is happening in sports, too. But the thing about it is, is the data by itself isn't going to do anything. We have got to be able to do something with the data. We've got to analyze it. And so what kind of things would you be interested in knowing? Well, this was, was from one of my favorite video games, um, NBA Jam, back in the early 90s, I think. Um, and Scotty Pippen's there making some dunks. You probably can't see it, but he is on fire, believe me. And the question is, you know, is, is this a hot hand streak? I mean, is, is he in a zone? Does this really exist? Can we say anything about the data to actually help us make that decision? Other things, like we just had the, the NCAA tournament. And, and did you pick the 12-5 upset? We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, what about, um, we just saw, some of you probably, um, saw the Masters. Um, should you work more on your short game or on your long game? And what's going what's to increase your chances um, to, to, to win a big tournament? Something you probably haven't thought about so much is would statistics play a role in snowboarding? Well, it turns out that it does. That one of the big questions about snowboarding is how to fall right. If you fall wrong, 
you're probably going to break something, usually your wrist. So things that, uh, in addition to that, things that you, you might care about, not just describing what's going on with the data, but actually using it to make decisions. And so for example, um, could you make a decision about which baseball player uh, the Cardinals should, should pick up? Right? How do you make that decision? Um, what about deciding um, the best training approach? If you're going to run a marathon, which approach should you take to do that? Can we use data to help us make that decision? Does icing the kicker work? What about in hockey? Uh, great win the other day for, for the Blues, obviously. Can you predict uh, what would happen in terms of a hat trick in, in, in game six, for example, or, or the best defensive strategy? Well, these are the kinds of questions that we're interested in, in talking about today. So now the boring part. So people ask me, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a statistician. And they say, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but the thing about it is, is that statistics actually has played a role throughout uh, much of society, in, in addition today with the sports. Um, and where did it start? Well, it started because people just wanted to keep track of stuff. You know, uh, in terms of uh, spoils of war, for example, keeping track of, of long lists of, of data of what you had uh, in a census or in, in spoils of war is actually a statistic. And when we say that, we mean it's just a number in a, in a table. And so at some point, though, somebody wants to start doing something with those numbers. And, and the perfect example of this is the bills of mortality, which you definitely can't read. But this is from the 1600s. And at the time, people started, when the, when the plague was going on, people started keeping track of not just how many people died, but what they died of. Because the goal there was to try to figure out, can we predict what is happening, who is dying, where are they living, and what's causing it? So this was, this was moving away from just keeping track of things to being able to say, what is that going to tell me about the future? So then, how does this relate to baseball or, or sports in general? Well, um, when we started looking at this, you know, I didn't realize when, when people started actually doing box scores. It actually goes back into the 1840s. This is a Wikipedia image, again, that you can't really see. But this from the um, 1870s looks very much like the box scores that you would have seen um, 10 or 20 years ago. Same kind of information. Um, the, the one on the right is actually from what I think is probably the greatest game ever, or one of the greatest series ever, which was the 1991 series uh, when the Twins won. And Erin and I have a, uh, a little debate about that. She's, she's from Minnesota, so she, of course, thinks that. But um, So we've kind of moved beyond that now. And, and, and what has changed? Well, again, I don't think you can probably see this, but there's, it didn't all just start. Um, uh, or the, uh, the revolution that we've seen in, in recent years didn't just start um, in 1980 with Bill James. What happened was there was a slow progression. We started with the box score in the 1840s, 1850s, and then we started adding things to it. We, we added a batting average um, in, in the 1870s. So an average, though, is kind of cool. You might know, think, oh, I know what an average is. I took some statistics. Um, well, the average is cool because it tells you that I can actually say something about the next game. If I just told you how many hits you got today, it wouldn't say that much. But if I said, on average, you're going to get you know, four hits, for example, then that says, oh, I can actually say what might happen tomorrow when I play. And so that was kind of a, a revolutionary thing in, in this world. So that, that kind of stuff kept going on. I, there was another one here that I didn't really mention, but that was um, adding on even more complicated things, like, like um, hits, um, uh, batting average with runners, in, in scoring position, right? So that's even a more complicated statistic. So, so people like Bill James started seeing this, and, and in the 1970s, um, the Saber Society was, was built, the Society for American Baseball Research. And this was an attempt to actually look at these statistics and sort of build new things, new information, to allow managers and, and even fans to be able to say what's going on in the game and to predict stuff. Most importantly, this was probably used to help identify which players a team would acquire. And this was what, if you saw Moneyball, this was the whole idea of sabermetrics that, that Bill James came up with, which is be able to identify features about players that hadn't been identified before to help give an advantage, in this case, to the Oakland A's. So you, you can't see this, but if you could, what this, what this image shows you is that I've got um, uh, some basic old-fashioned statistics for Cespedes and Rodriguez, 
and it's actually just showing that they're both pretty comparable um, if you look at the old, old statistics, um, although it probably looks like, well, it's up to you to decide which is your favorite statistic, on base percentage or batting average. If you go into more complicated statistics, the things that Sabermetrics does, for example, total bases and slugging percentage and, uh, and, and even war statistics, then what happens is that if you look at these numbers, you'll end up seeing that they, they don't look very much different, and yet Rodriguez made $22 million in, in 2015, and Cespedes made $3.7 million. So who's got the best value there? And so this is the kind of thing that Sabermetrics was allowing people to do and to try to find the diamond in the rough, find the right player to help, help my team that maybe somebody else hadn't, ha hadn't seen. So what's the next step to that? Right, at some point, we're going to run out of, of traditional things to, to look at. The next step had to do with technology. And so, for example, I don't know about you, but when, when I played baseball as a kid, <laughs> I, I always was trying to hit a home run. Right? Every time I came up to bat, I'm, I'm going to knock one out of the park. Of course, I didn't, but I thought I was. Right? That's how I did it. Then later on, you're taught, no, no, you should hit, hit the ball low and hard. Right? That's, how, that's how I was taught later on. And that's how a lot of professionals were taught as well. And then once we started tracking this information with, with more complicated um, uh, data tools that, that Aaron will talk about, then, then we had new information. We could, every single swing, we could talk about the hit speed, the attack angle, and other information about how the ball left the bat. And so pretty soon it was, it was clear that the best place to hit was the sweet spot was 25 to 35 degrees. And so we're, we're going back to hitting like we, like we did when we were kids. So what's the point of that? The point is, what we're, what we're doing is we're using data to come up with new information that sometimes contradicts what we thought we knew before. So the data revolution is here, and so is Aaron. <laughs> Does anybody need another beer? <laughs> no, we're good. All right, so as Chris was just saying, the data revolution is here. Big data are here. Right? And we're thinking about this big data. This is my big data wave. What we're thinking about is advances in technology. We have data coming from cell phones, from GPS trackers. Right? Some of you got here based on your GPS tracker on your phone or in your car. We've got satellites orbiting the Earth all the time, collecting information on the, on the environment in particular. We've got personalized medicine devices. Right? All of these have led to an extreme amount of data, and it has been our job as statisticians over the past, say, 21st century so far, is to come up with ways to handle and to tackle this type of data. Right? From a sports perspective, this turns into data on athletes, on teams, on referees, on opponents. Right? We want to figure out how these data can be used in different ways to actually evaluate our players, predict who's going to win the next game, uh, who's training at what, at what rate? Can we make strategic or tactical decisions based on the data that we're obtaining? One that you maybe haven't thought of, but how can we enhance the fan experience? Okay, you've seen this when you start watching uh, the NHL back in the early 90s, they had the puck tracker. If you think back now to the way that that puck was tracked back in the 90s, you'll find out that uh, next year, NHL season, they're actually gonna be having player tracker coming on. It's gonna revolutionize the way that we watch hockey uh, starting uh, next season. The goal of this now from a sports analyst perspective is to try to identify patterns. Okay? Identify patterns in the data that we can see that help us can maybe inform these strategies, inform the way that we optimize our player training and our player performance. Just like last week, Chris and I and some of our undergraduate and graduate students met with some of the folks uh, with Mizzou Athletics in the performance side to see if we can come up with a way to uh, improve the way that our football team is practicing in terms of training loads Right, the amount of energy that our, our players are expending during practice to try to optimize their performance. Right. We want to optimize our player performance on Saturdays. So how should we be training throughout the week, Monday through Friday, to get into a game on Saturday to be as good as we can possibly be? One example that Chris already mentioned is thinking about training profiles for marathon runners. Okay, we have marathon runners, and on the left-hand side of this picture, perhaps you can just see that there's three different colors. The top here is black, the middle here is red, the bottom is blue. And what we're seeing is that throughout the course of a race, the left is the start of a marathon, the right is the end of the marathon, 26.2 miles. Here is the relative pace of those particular runners. As you can see, any of these three groups of runners, their pace is slowing down. Okay? 
those of you that have run a marathon, you know that that usually happens, right? As we get tired, we slow down, but then at the very end, we might pick up our pace just a little bit to cross the finish line strong. Well, if we look at that, we notice that the black line ends up slowing down the most throughout the race, whereas the blue line tends to stay as evenly paced as possible, okay, based on these three pers perspectives. What the right-hand plot is showing is that on the x-axis is the relative time. The only thing you need to look at is on the left-hand side, these are the folks that are running faster than their average for their age and their gender. Of those people that are running faster than they're maybe expected to be, the majority of them, almost 90% of them, are following the blue race profile. They're running as constant of a pace as possible throughout that race to try to finish as fast as possible. On the far right-hand side, we see uh, the folks that are running slower than what their average is for their age and gender. And they're really split between mostly the black and the red profiles where they're seeing a lot of slowing down. Okay. This is not to say that if you run a steady eddy pace throughout the entire 26.2 miles that you're guaranteed to qualify for Boston, for example, because that pace has got to be at a pretty good clip. One of the other things that Chris had mentioned earlier was this drive for show, putt for dough. Any of you that have learned to play golf have learned this little lingo, and it usually told us to say, get out there on the putting green and start practicing your short game. The question is, is that really where strokes gain occurs? So old statistics when we learned when we were playing golf, things that we would keep track of were things like, how many times did you hit the fairway in a round? How many times did you hit the green in regulation? How many putts did you have? Now with the increased technology that we have, we know about every shot on every course from every angle that our professionals are hitting. This is used some shot tracker technology. Right. Think about this. We have, say, starting the, the field of the tournament, we have 140 players. They're each going to hit, on average, par, 72 strokes around. We got four rounds. That's a lot of shots that are being tracked for one particular tournament. And how can we actually t take that back to figure out where on the golf course are we gaining the most on our competition? Is it because I'm hitting my driver really well, or is it because I'm making long putts? That's the question that we're now able to answer from all this data that's being collected. So Mark Brody, who's probably the, the most leading uh, stats person that's working in the area of golf, has said that short game and putting makes up just 32% of the difference in players or th that are winning tournaments versus everybody else, right? whereas the driving and the approach shots make up the other 68%. That's not what we would have expected, right? That's not what we were taught back in when we were learning to play golf. And so if I look at, again, we don't need to focus on the details here so much, but if we looked at the top 10 scoring average rankings from the 2018 season, right, what it shows is that you can see some familiar names, the Dustin Johnson, the Justin Rose, the Justin Thomases, Mr. Tiger Woods down here in seventh. Right, what we're seeing is that their strokes game putting, only one out of those 10 people is even in the top 20 in terms of strokes game putting. This is not where they're performing that well. But if we look at their strokes gain T to green, we're seeing that all but two of them are in the top 20 and most of them are in the top 10. So is, am I telling you right now that you should go out to the driving range and practice your driver? Or am I telling you you should go practice your chipping and putting? Well, if you're one of these guys who my data pertain to, you should be practicing your driver or your long irons. If you're one of these people or you're me or you're Chris, right? we should probably stick to the short game. Okay, so we've got to make sure we know where the data is coming from when we're coming with our results. Other types of data that we're coming in contact with now as we start working with some of the coaches and in sports teams at Mizzou are things like event data. And again, every sport's different. Every sport collects their own different types of data. But things like shots or passes or backhands, we have events located around the basketball court, around the football field, around the soccer field, but where events are happening. That's important information we can start learning about who has certain types of patterns, where we expect these different baseball players to hit or pitchers to throw when we're coming in from a strategic or um, optimizing performance perspective. One of our former uh, Mizzou alum, Brad Alberts, has now recently got hired by Boston Red Sox. Right? So when he was here at Mizzou, he invented what was called the baseball ump tracker. Right? Now, not only are we trying to analyze or figure out what, what's going on from the opponent or offensive perspective, we're, trying to, we're also able to monitor what umpires are calling balls and strikes. This picture represents the square, uh, the strike zone, 
And each pitch that's located on this particular day in this first game of the season, uh, Red Sox versus the Mariners, is either red or green, whether it's called a ball or a strike. Well, it turns out the worst pitch of the day by any umpire on this particular day, which was, I believe, what, March 29th was the opening day, was a ball that was called, and it was well in the strike zone. This is information that we can use not only on our baseball players, but also those that are refing these types of games. How many St. Louis Blues fans do I have out there? Awesome, right? They had a big game win on Saturday. What we saw this year, if you recall, back to the, the winter season, we had a 10-game winning streak. What I'm showing in these two pictures is a heat map showing where were the shots most likely taken on the left hand, starting from the opening day through February 17th, which was the end of that 10-game win streak. On the right, it was just purely those 10 games. Are we seeing patterns in where the hot spots are? Offensive is shown here in red, uh, and defensive is shown here in blue. We're seeing some differences of where we were taking some shots from and where we were defending shots from when we were on that hot streak. This is statistics, right? How can we use this information to inform our strategy, both offensive and defensive? Our softball team, if you've been following Mizzou softball, has been having a great season so far. They were selected last in the SEC, and they're now, I think, currently sitting at fifth. We had a big uh, three-game win over Texas A&M this past weekend. High-resolution monitors are being used by softball and baseball and golf and other sports at Mizzou to try and to track the movement of the spin on the ball. Or you can think of it coming off the, the golf club, off a tennis racket, the bat, the pitcher. We can think about things like the spin of the ball, the axes at which the bat was coming through the ball, as the picture Chris was showing. Attack angles, directions. This is all, again, additional information that's coming to us from all the sensors that these coaches are putting on our players. How can we use this to inform strategy when we start wanting to win games? Again, golf clubs, tennis rackets, you maybe wouldn't have thought of this, but you can also put it on, your, on your, your bicycle. How is the foot coming through as it's rotating through to maximize power as you're trying to propel forward or up a hill? Think about sensors in football, right? This has revolutionized the way that we're, we're, we're coaching and our football players are playing in sort of to protect safety of our players. There are sensors now in helmets. There's actually mouth guards that are being used that can measure the, the direction, the magnitude, right, and the duration of hits on the head. What this can be used is in real time, players, coaches can take this information and, and determine how hard was that hit that that player just saw, should we pull them out of the game? This is done real time on the sidelines. It's, uh, it's definitely revolutionizing, again, the way that these players are being, are being taken care of, and again, for player safety. Here we have a sprinter taking off the sprinting blocks. This is, could just as easily this, be the starting block of a swimmer. What is the pressure that this runner is placing on these, these blocks as she takes off onto a sprint of 100 meters? Is there things that we can do to inform not only her reaction time to the gun going off, but how she's putting pressure on with her right and left foot as she takes off to try to maximize getting to the finish line as fast as we can? Again, this is all data that's being come in high resolution and how can we as statisticians come up with a way to monitor this and model this? A couple different types today that we might also add. Right now, put GPS trackers on our players. Now we know literally where they are at all times in X, Y, and height coordinates. Right? We do this. Right? Football players have it in the back of their helmet or back of their shoulder pads during every practice and every game. We know where they are. We know where they're moving. We know how hard they're working. Our soccer players have the exact same thing. They have, they have their GPS trackers on them. We can watch them run around the field if we make a little video of it. Here's two basketball players. Here's player A on the left, player B on the right. They're both playing offense in these particular pictures, and the arrows are the pointing in the direction that the player tends to always head. Notice that player A, arrows are always pointing towards the hoop. This person is always driving the basket. Player B never has an arrow pointing towards the hoop. This player is always trying to get itself to the three-point line. If you were playing defense on this and you knew this type of information on the opponent, this is critical information to have if you're going into the game next weekend to play this team. All this is information, again, coming to us at a high resolution. And as statisticians, it's our job to try to tease out these types of stories and patterns. Last type of data that we're now looking at, thinking about biometric or biomedical data, uh, biomechanical data. 
This is heart rate, heart rate variability, blood oxygen saturation. How well are they sleeping? Right? Maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but we are coach Hello? Oh. coaches are recording or are evaluating the sleep of our players. How is that, how is that affecting their performance on, on a day-to-day -day basis? Biomechanical data is looking at structural or body mechanics training load. How much energy are these individuals expending on a day-to-day -day ba basis in practice? And again, how can we maximize their performance on game day? Here's a brief example that looks at a, two individuals' um, VO2 max, which is, is a measure of the amount of oxygen volume that they can take in. Right? So each individual has its own maximum value. Depending on how hard it's running or how hard it's trying, you're getting up to that 100% level. These two individuals are going through the exact same training. The color here just switches between white when you're in the 0 to 30 percentile. It switches to light blue when you're in the 30 to 50 percentile. Dark blue from 50 to 75. And when you are at your close to your max, above 75th percentile, it switches to red. As the training day goes on, from X, on the, along the x-axis here, what we're seeing is that athlete number one up top is able to recover throughout the practice. Spikes comes back down, spikes comes back down. Whereas player B, once it gets to that high level, it is unable to recover throughout the rest of that practice. It stays at a high level throughout the entire time. This is really informative as we start tracking our players Right, and comparing them not to just one another, but how they're imp improving throughout the season, starting from, say, training camp through the end of the football season, for example. So again, all this information is great. Whenever we can use it to actually inform the decisions, this is fantastic. One caveat to this type of data, however, is what is the ethical decisions behind this? Who owns it? Who's protecting it? Who has it and who can benefit from it? Everyone. Right? As, you're, as the offensive team, the defensive team, the fans, the people that are doing fantasy drafts, right? this is all critical information to be able to use in order to make some decisions. So at the end of the day, players still remain quite weary about this type of data at all, at all sort of levels because you're unsure of whether or not that's going to be used against you when you're starting to renegotiate a contract. The last little example I'm going to show you, this is a figure that we were just shown by some of our, our collaborators at, with Mizzou football. This is the first four weeks of the training season last year. So August 3rd through September 1st, four weeks of data, where we're looking at the average player training load, so how much energy were they exerting on a day-to-day -day basis, on average, that's the blue. And the, the, right, the, or the orange here is showing the maximum speed or maximum velocity of those particular athletes on average. Is there some sort of relationship between the performance or that maximum velocity of runners as a function of how they were training on that particular day or previous days? Does yesterday, how much energy I expend, inform on how I'm going to perform tomorrow? Those are the questions that they're trying to answer. And we're, we're working on this. This is week one. I'm working on this project. But these are exciting things to be thinking about from a statistical point of view is can we be informing our Mizzou athletics to, again, perform better next season? I'm going to switch it over to Chris here to think a bit, talk a little bit more now about the modeling side of things. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, um, yeah, give her a hand. So, so the stuff that Aaron presented there, all these cool sources of data that we have available to us now, um, it's sort of like kids in a candy store for us. Now, what is it that makes those things, which are essentially like fancy versions of those tables I showed you before, they're just, they're plots and stuff, but how do you actually use that to make decisions? And this is where the statistics part, the big S statistics comes in, and that means what do we, we need to take that information and build models with it to be able to answer questions. The how, the when, the where, the why, and be able to give you some measure of how certain we are about that. And that's what we do in statistics. So we're taking that data and we're going to build models with it to answer questions. And so here's, the, I, I mentioned this 12-5 upset um, issue. And so the conventional wisdom is, that, yeah, there, there's this 12-5, the 12 seed, always pick the 12 seed, or at least pick one of them, right? You know, it's gonna, gonna give you a good shot at winning. 
And then there's one that maybe you, you're aware of or maybe not, and it's called the, the middle seed anomaly. And that's the notion that, that 10, 11, and 12 seeds get to the final four more often than, than teams that are higher seeded than them up to, you know, to a point. And so how do we answer that? Well, one of our good friends and colleagues who's at the University of Iowa um, did a study, a statistical analysis of this, where he actually used models and probability theory and all this. And, and you can kind of see what he found. Um, the evidence is really weak for the 12-5 upset. And you can kind of see it just from the data itself that there's not, uh, as, you, as you go further down uh, the seedings, the eight to nine is essentially a 50-50, right? Not, not a big surprise. But as you go up, there really isn't th something that's not that ex unexpected. And so the 12-5 upset is about a 65% chance. And so what happened this year? Anybody remember? Yeah, I think I heard that. There, there were three, three um, 12 seeds that, uh, or three five seeds that won, right? And I think Oregon was the only 12 seed that, that won this time. And so is that unusual? And, and so the, the answer is not really. About one out of every nine years we should see that happen. And so that was kind of what, what, what our friend Dale Zimmerman found. Whereas the middle seed anomaly is actually very highly significant. And they have some theories as to why that is, which you know, I'm not sure I, I'm necessarily in agreement with. But there's no doubt, even if you, you probably can't see this, but the probability of these middle seed teams getting to the final four are, are much higher. And in this case, I think Oregon was the only one. Oregon was a 12 seed and got into the, into the final four this year. So again, not, not, not surprising that that's going to happen. So that's the kind of stuff that modeling can do for us. The next question here um, is, well, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. <laughs> I'm back. So what we're seeing now with all the data that I went through, all the different types, we have events, we have trackers. Now it's starting to think about modeling perspective that Chris was just mentioning. Now what do we do when we have multiple players? They're moving in continuous time, and they're interacting with one another. They're trying to optimize space from an offensive perspective. They're trying to optimize space from a defensive perspective. And there's another team that's coming at us. We have to come up with the statistical models and algorithms to help us analyze that type of uh, realistic re realization. In addition, right, put now biometric sensors on our players. Model their heart rate and their accelerometer as they run around a soccer field with GPS and then add all their teammates. <laughs> so this is sort of a less exciting of a, of, a, of a picture, but it shows the idea. We have all of these different axes that data is being collected on. And as a statistician, we've got to pull all of this together with data that's coming in at roughly, say, 1 20th of a second. These are massive data sets. There's so much information, and it's our job to now come up with ways to tease out these types of a story. So here's Chris going to mention again now how these, some of these models go. So we're doing this to keep you awake now. Uh, but we're almost finished, believe me. Um, so, so this is th this point that Aaron just made. We have all these data now. What are we going to do with them? Well, it turns out that some of our colleagues have been doing this for a long time in other areas. In ecology, there's this big interest in understanding social networks and how animals uh, interact with each other over time and over space. And, and essentially, this is like our Twitter page social network, which, by the way, I think we doubled it last time we gave one of these talks from 5 to 10. So <laughs> help us out. Um, so, but, so I'm going to call this the flipper effect. So Aaron did some work with, a, with an undergraduate a, a while back. And they, and they were analyzing the social network of, of dolphins. And it turns out that, that everyone pretty much likes flipper, except the striped dolphins. And the striped dolphins are off on their own. And so when they did this, they used some fancy statistical modeling to be able to identify which of these individuals liked each other. And that's, in other words, how do they, how do they behave at the same time? Well, the next step then is how do they move together? And so this is this notion of how complex networks actually change through time. And you might have seen ants that build a bridge so they can cross. Or, or how do birds know to flock together? So this is, again, one of these areas where think about like fish that are, that are swimming in a, in a, in a school. Oh, that's the referee. Don't, don't worry about him. Oh, there's two of them. That's the anchor. 
So, so the, we've studied this a lot, both in our groups at, at Mizzou, but, but our colleagues in, in the wildlife area. And the, and the idea is the fish are going to move or the bird's going to move, and it's going to pay attention to what its neighbor's doing. Right? And there's very, various ways that it might do that. And once you know that, if, if I pay close attention to my neighbors, but only the nearby ones, I'm going to move it just with collectively, but, but not with everyone at the same time. But if I look at a large neighborhood, we're all going to move together. And so in this case, we actually can model that. And this, this particular one, if you can see it, this is a very, we're not looking very far out. So we're kind of doing our own thing. But if, if somebody's next to me, I'll swim with them for a while. Whereas this one, we're modeling it, so we're all kind of doing the same thing. This would be like the birds flocking. So we're now at Mizzou, we're working on a project with, with our colleagues over in Fisheries and Wildlife, and we've got trackers, a GPS and accelerometers on birds. Uh, these are our uh, white-fronted geese, and they're migrating further uh, towards the north um, for, the, for the breeding season. And that they also, we have accelerometer data on them, and we can tell not only where they are, but what they're doing. Because the if they're eating, they have a different behavior than if they're sleeping or if they're flying. So, so this is the motivation then for how could we use this same kind of technique. And here's an example. And again, if you could see this up close, I would ask you if you could tell the difference between what was real on this, on this basketball um, animation versus what is fake. So the offensive, the blue players here, are actually, that's an example of, of some real players. And then the defense, one of these plots has the red the defenders on, in red that actually perform, and the other one is a model, uh, an AI model using a, what's called a uh, generative adversarial network. And so this is, it's really difficult. I mean, you can actually tell sometimes which one's which if you look at it very carefully, but it's very difficult to tell the difference. This is using a ton of data, using all these kind of data that Aaron mentioned to actually model how a defense should react to offensive players. And so this is kind of the new revolution. This is the future. The future is how do we take all these data? What do we do with them? How do we answer these kinds of questions? And the thing is, and this is why, why we love this, is because, and why this is important for arts and science at Mizzou, is because there are very few people being trained to do this in the US right now. It's overseas, in the UK and Australia, it's a big deal. In the US, we know of three places right now um, coming out of business schools where people are doing some sports analytics training. So I'm going to turn this over to Erin to tell, let her kind of finish up with this. All right, so our plan at Mizzou, what we've just been launching uh, sort of over the last few months, pulling this together, which we'll actually be launching here in the fall, is that we have a sports analytics program that's starting up, starting in uh, fall 2019. Right, so what does this mean? We have a certificate program that has four online courses two courses in statistical modeling, two courses in sports analytics. These can be taught at both the undergrad and graduate level, meaning both our, our current students and our undergrads and grad students can be taking these classes as online classes in, um, in tangent of what they're currently doing with their coursework. They don't actually have to be Mizzou students at all. You can be a degree-seeking student or a non-degree-seeking student to enroll in these classes. So anyone in this audience could sign up right now for these courses that are going to be launched uh, again fall 2019. The only prerequisite for these types of classes, or this certificate program in general, is just one college-level intro stat class. Okay? So most of our, our students at Mizzou, that's a requirement already, is these students are going to be ready to take these classes starting up again now, just this next calendar or academic year. So the first course that we're most excited about that's being introduced, it's being currently developed right now, it's going to be launching again in the fall, is this Methods in Sports Analytics 1. This is the link right now, online.mizzou.edu is where you wanted to go if you wanted to get uh, logged into this class and get registered right now, you could do that. This is a purely an introductory course, collecting, processing, visualizing the data, analyzing data in sports, all the technologies that are being used, what are the different softwares that we can be looking at the data with, both from a statistical perspective, but also a visualization and graphic perspective as well. One of the most important things in our job as statisticians, especially as we start working with these coaches in our programs at Mizzou, is to produce graphics and figures that then can be used by the coaches, which then can be shared with the players to actually be implemented in practice and in games. Why is this so exciting to us right now? As Chris was mentioning, there are very few uh, programs in the nation that are, are doing sports analytics in general, and again, all of them are coming from a business school perspective. Ours will be the first now coming from an actual statistics program. 
But there's great connections of this across the campus at Mizzou. We have connections to the econ department and sports marketing that's already doing a lot of, of this from the marketing perspective, ticket sales uh, types of things. We have one of the, if not the best journalism program in the nation. Think about data journalism, sports journalism. You've seen some of the work that's coming out of those groups that's related to sports. This pertains to this exactly. We got Mizzou Athletics. We currently have students plugged in with soccer, softball, baseball, football uh, programs, swimming here in the, in the near next few weeks. We're getting coaches, we're getting athletes, we're getting students involved in doing some of these analytics uh, right now. Other big entities on our campus are the Mizzou Orthopedics Institute, the new translational precision medicine complex that's uh, uh, sort of coming online now. There's a lot of people interested in this across our campus that we're trying to make this sort of one area that they can start developing the skills to do this type of, of work in. You might say, okay, well, great, we can take these classes, we can get their certificate, but what about jobs? I see jobs posted every day that are looking for someone that can do sports analytics. Do you have a background in stats? Do you have a background in data and data informatics? Can you actually analyze large volumes of data? As we said throughout this talk, we have students currently working for both the Cleveland Indians, the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Boston Red Sox. We have Mizzou alum at Sporting KC. We have uh, some connections and collaborations with the Professional Referees Organization of the MLS. Those are just some of the pro organizations. Obviously, Mizzou Athletics is a big one, but there's also sports analytics companies, the companies that are creating these data sets that we've been talking about, right? the ones that are actually putting the sensors on these athletes to record and, and, and measure the type of information that we want to be having. Again, SportLogic is the, is the company that's being hired out now by the, by the NHL for the player tracking that I mentioned that's going to be online starting next hockey season. All of these offer opportunities for our students from this particular program in order to hopefully land some successful jobs. The last one I have listed here is I just saw for the first time an academic position uh, listed that was looking for a faculty member, an assistant or associate professor in sports analytics. That's the first one I've ever seen uh, as I've been looking for types of jobs that our students could be landing in. So again, this is a booming field and we're getting in at the cutting edge here at Mizzou. So with that, I'm going to have Chris stand up here again uh, and take any questions that you guys might have. And then, again, M-I-Z. Questions? Questions? Go for it. Yep. Oh, you have to yell. Ooh, great question. Uh, to be honest, so Chris and I went and met with the entire sort of head staff of all athletic programs in December. So we had everyone in the room uh, from all the different programs that wanted, to, that wanted to be there. And I would say the most eager person or eager team to meet with us is Mizzou Softball. They've been the most receptive to trying to actually getting some analytics in the game. And so we have a couple students right now that are working with them and doing some uh, sort of preliminary analyses. Again, this is not the perfect time for them because they're in season and they're playing so well that we don't want to disrupt the system. Uh, but again, hopefully starting when their season's uh, completed up this summer, we'll be able to dive in a little bit more. But again, other programs have been engaged as well. We have students working with soccer, again, the performance uh, athletic group. Baseball, we've had students working with them for a long time. Other? Uh, soccer. And, oh, soccer as well. Yeah. Yeah, good question. We're hoping everybody by the end. I'll go here and then I'll go there. You want to take it? You know, that's a great question and it is definitely coming up. We have not had those interactions at Mizzou yet, but that is on the agenda. Of, we're making this um, attempt to try to talk to people at almost every school, uh, every college on campus, because there's connections everywhere. And that's one that's on the list. We just haven't made the connection yet. But they have from the athletic side. Oh, yeah. Certainly the athletic department has already made that connection. But in terms of the analytic part, not so much. But in terms of the data confidentiality, for sure.
Yeah, that's a great question. So from the Mizzou perspective, the only sort of example I can come up with right now is I definitely know that the soccer team does at halftime, but it's not necessarily a real-time, middle-of-the-game activity. So they are monitoring them throughout the game. Um, a lot of the data collection that's being, that I was even showing, we know that when we talk to one of the assistant coaches with basketball, is they're not allowed to view video during the game. So there's a lot of rules that are set up, and they're very much sports-specific on handling how that data can be used real time. In so in, in, in the college level, at the pro level, different ball game. Yeah. Yeah, good question though. Yeah, great question. We have some Mizzou alum here that are a little more savvy with the analytics than I am. Uh, the, the sort of silly figures that I made were all based in R, but I know that Python is a big one. Um, those are the two big ones. Those are probably the two big ones for statisticians. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. That is a fantastic question. Oh, sorry, let me start. I can start repeating the question. She's wondering from, a, again, the legal side, are students required to be wearing, in order for their scholarship to come through, are they required to have these sensors on them at all times? Unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. I have not ever had a coach talk to us about there being pushback from any of their players. So whether or not they've signed off on it, let's hope that with their own free will at this point. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, I mean, my, my sense, but I, I'm biased here because I work with, with data that, about movement a lot, but I, I truly believe that it's the, it's the real-time positioning information that's going to be crucial. I mean, you can already see it in terms of shifts that go on now that didn't go on five years ago, and that, that's part of this revolution, but I think you're going to see it even more more frequently, like, like not even just as a new batter comes on, but, but depending on the pitch count. You know, they're go you're going to see almost, <laughs> it's going to look like a different game because there's going to be movement going on, you know, almost in real time. That, that's my prediction, um, just because I think that data has been underutilized so far. Uh, there is definitely some evidence to suggest that streaks exist, for sure. Um, I think uh, the question is whether or not these streaks are actually, you know, random occurrences or not. And, and I think um, my own personal belief is that there, the people are actually in a physiologically higher mode sometimes. And I think there's some evidence to that, but I don't think it's been conclusively shown yet. Anyway, very cross sport and game. Yeah, of course that would change. It depends on the sport and, and by the game, yeah, for sure. What kind of ethical considerations do you guys look at as it relates to sports gambling? Because with all this fast amounts of data, it seems like you could get a little bit of a edge on making you know, big bets on who's going to perform better. Yeah, you want to take that? I mean, <laughs> we actually. <laughs> um, I have a, we have a couple, uh, several former students in the, in the audience, um, some of whom did some projects. One, one of whom is here who did his master's project on, on sports betting. Um, but I, I won't call him out. But anyway, I'll let Aaron actually in, handle that question. Well, I was just going to say that there's some very highly trained and skillful statisticians that work in Vegas on working on the odds. So I don't know if we're going to be able to actually beat that by doing any of our analytics other than trying to come up with exactly what they were doing in order to actually, if you could figure out where they made the spread, then maybe you'd be able to inform your own decisions. But uh, again, there's been people working on this for a long time, and I'm not sure we're at that level. One way in the back. What kind of what is there in that? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, great question. So I only know this just from uh, working with some of the coaches in soccer, but yeah, so when the contracts come through from the actual companies, whether it be Catapult or Polar or whoever, Garmin, that's providing the technology, usually if the football team gets it, then the other teams can get it underneath their own contract. But yeah, so that's exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's a team investment that they are then able to share underneath one contract with that particular company. I think we've got time for one more question. One more, all right. Yeah. Well, I think what we've seen so far, at least you know, at the intercollegiate level, that this is one of the big challenges because even to get the head coaches to buy in is not as easy as you might think. Assistant coaches seem to be a lot, I guess, more amenable to, to these things. Um, and then their job is to convince the players that this is going to help. And so what we've seen so far is that, um, like in the training component, it's pretty helpful because I think most most players are used to being coached in that regard. Like if you if you lift this amount of weight today, it's going to help you tomorrow. That seems to be easier than the strategy and tactics um, to get to get them to buy into that. But most coaches that, that we talk to say that that's a problem no matter what they're trying to tell them. Right? That that it's always hard to get players at the college level to buy in to what you want them to do, and that's that's part of the key. So I think. Communication is a big part of all of this, and we're still learning it, honestly. And just one example of that would be we're with some, with, some of the, with some of the soccer data is that the coaches are interested in coming down with just a couple metrics that they can tell their players. And so what they've seen is that when the, when the opposing team takes more shots inside the 18-yard box, that's where most high probability shots come from. So if, as a defender, you can force them to take shots from further out then you're imp improving your, your team score from a, from a defensive strategy. So again, that can inform our tactics or our strategy from just one pure number saying, keep them outside the 18. Thank you. And, and this, is, this is what we do at Mizzou. It's pretty neat. So enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you for coming out.